On-field volatility seems to have got worse since the advent of live television coverage, or maybe it hasn't got worse at all. Maybe it's just that we notice it or are made aware of it by a commentator who, as a player, was no doubt an angel. <laughs> when the players can see in the dressing room that the umpire may have made a mistake, then some of that respect and sometimes trust they've had for a particular umpire may well begin to disintegrate or even disappear. They are more likely to stand and either dispute a decision or make it quite apparent to all and sundry they disagree with the umpire. My simple advice as a player and as a coach was that the players make far more mistakes than the umpires ever do, ever, ever do. so just get on with it. Just get on with it. The thing which really worries me is that the administrators of the game will take all the characters from the game. We cannot afford to clone players into being silent robots who go about their business without either a smile or a frown. Passion remains paramount. And there's nothing more satisfying to the paying public than to see a player with passion. Cricket is very much part of the entertainment business and the players are responsible for the show. Continue to educate them, but let them perform their wonderful skills with great passion and flair. To my mind, a great example of overzealous interference by the administrators came during one of the quarterfinals of the recent World Cup. Australia were playing Pakistan at the Adelaide Oval in front of a bumper crowd. We'd bowled Pakistan out for a mediocre 217. And I must say, the atmosphere at the ground was very ho-hum. There was no atmosphere, really, as we were cruising to victory. Enter left arm fast bowler Wahid Riaz. Well, all of a sudden, Pakistan had got up off the floor and were counter-punching because this young man was desperate to win. He bowled with terrific pace. He bounced out our captain and then made life extremely uncomfortable for the experienced Shane Watson and then Glenn Maxwell. All of a sudden, the crowd came to life. It may have been because Riaz got right in the face of Watson and even blew him the odd kiss. <laughs> Whatever happened out there was intriguing and brought the game to life. As a result of Riaz breathing life into an ordinary contest, both he and Shane Watson were fined for their on-field behaviour. Leave me alone. Jeez, what's going on there? What should have happened? They should have both been given a bonus. That's what should have happened. <laughs> The spirit of the game is very straightforward to me and I feel as though I understand it completely. <laughs> <laughs> I was involved in two incidents during my career for which I thought I received unfair praise. The first was during the centenary test match at the MCG in 1977. That man, Randall, stars again. <laughs> he was given out caught behind of Greg Chappell and I called him back. What are you doing, Rodney? He was well over 100 at the time, and had we not dismissed him, England probably would have won this historic match, maybe. The ball did not carry to me, I promise you. Otherwise, I wouldn't have called him back, obviously. And therefore, it wasn't out. It was a simple decision, because I hadn't caught the ball. The fact that he didn't hit it had nothing to do with my decision. <laughs> I was taught not to cheat, and I mean that, and it would have been cheating had I not called him back. Simple. Why should I be praised for doing this? It was the correct thing to do. Now, the other incident uh, was also at the MCG in the early 80s in a one-day match against New Zealand. This was the infamous underarm delivery, and although I don't, honestly don't recall exactly what I did, television footage showed me shaking my head apparently and saying something like, don't do it. <laughs> At this stage, it was within the laws of the game, but it certainly wasn't within the spirit of the game, and the law has since been changed. A couple of amazing things there. Bruce Edgar um, got one of the best hundreds you'll ever see in a one-day game, and Brian McKechnie didn't get fined for throwing his bat. 
Amazing. <laughs> yeah, I reckon I understand the spirit of cricket law pretty well, but I'm not so sure about some of the other laws. Now, let me begin with the no ball law. I can't see why we ever went to the front foot law, and just quietly, I can reveal there are a few umpires out there at the moment who are beginning to wish we'd revert to the back foot law. You put yourself in their position when a batsman with a massive weapon, bat that is, runs at the bowler <laughs> and smashes a straight drive at about chest height. I, for one, would want to be standing back as far as possible and by reverting to the back foot law, the umpire has a chance to stand at least two metres back. It's only a matter of time before an umpire in an international or first class match is seriously hurt, if not killed. This appears most likely to occur in T20 cricket, but looking at the World Cup earlier this year, it could happen at any time. If I happen to be umpiring right now, I'd be wearing a baseball catcher's helmet, a chest pad and shin guards, also an abdominal protector, and that wouldn't be the pink plastic variety. <laughs> and maybe we have to make this safety gear for umpires compulsory for all international and first class games. One could argue that the bowler is even more at risk and there'll be no argument from me on this. I've only ever heard of a bowler being struck in the head by a drive once and this occurred in Brisbane on December the 5th, 1976 when Viv Richards was playing for Queensland and incidentally Viv was batting, not bowling. And his slightly lofted straight drive took out the Tasmanian medium pace bowler Kevin Badcock. Badcock was taken to the Princess Alexandra Hospital where he spent the night with a seriously fractured cheekbone. Somehow the bowlers seem to get out of the way in the, most times, as do the umpires. But what worries me is the deflection from the bowler's hand. The poor umpire is just standing there minding his own business. The ball smashed back. Bowler gets a fingertip to it, it changes direction. He then has got no chance. He needs to be standing back a little bit further. Now, just a few days after the tragic death of Philip Hughes, former Israel captain Hillel Oscar died while standing as an umpire at the bowler's end. Reportedly, the ball ricocheted from the stumps to his head. Five years before that, in Swansea, a 72-year umpire died after being hit in the head by a ball thrown by a fieldsman. Now, I realise the back foot law wouldn't have helped that umpire in Swansea, but it could well have helped Mr Oscar had he been back a bit further. Now, it makes my blood boil every time I'm quoted as having delivered one of the best ever cricket sledges. 